a shorter panel. Uh, and please let us welcome um, Imam Ibrahim Mogra, who's with us live from United Kingdom. Uh, Can we jump here? No, no, you please. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, my colleague. Uh, online with us is Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg. I introduce our panelists broader in a um, second. And let's also please welcome Sebastian Duda from Catholic Intelligentsia Club from Vienna. Uh, please join me here. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we cannot be uh, we cannot be joined by um, Bishop Michael of Coman, who was supposed to be here, the exarch of the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. Uh, but but we hope that we'll be able to um, have a great discussion, nevertheless. Uh, so let me start with a very brief introduction: why this kind of panel on this kind of conference. Of course, religious leaders, intellectuals, deal with ethics, deal with values. But our distinguished guests also uh, had a chance, and we are very grateful for that, to, to, to uh, Rabbi Wittenberg and to uh, Imam Ibrahim Mogra, they joined us, Europa Patient, and a delegation of religious leaders, Christianity, Islam, uh, Judaism, uh, in Kiev after the full-scale invasion. So, uh, and me with many many others of their of their of their actions also recent, they showed that this interfaith dialogue is a real thing in taking on the, the, the challenges we are facing, including climate change. So my question would be same, and Sebastian Duda, for those people who are in Poland, the ancient Catholic Intelligentsia Club is well known, but for, for our, some of our international uh, guests, it's probably the most impactful um, intellectual Catholic uh, milieu uh, also with, with some avenues to, 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 to political decision making. Just to mention our first prime minister after the fall of communism was editor-in-chief of Wiesz, Tadeusz Mazowiecki. Uh, so, um, I would just say one thing concerning the kind of opening, opening question. Um, Inspiration for, from religious traditions is also important for imagination. Because in recent years, we could say there was too much of the thinking of the end of history and how much we can achieve. But with COVID crisis, with climate breakdown, we also see a kind of capitulation of let's just live with those crises. Let's just get used to living with people dying of COVID, people dying because of climate change, and so on. So my question would be, what kind of inspiration, what kind of widening of our imagination, and what kind of action as well can those different respective religious tradition bring to these discussions between um, people representing civil society, but also decision makers. So I'll, uh, we'll, we'll start with, with Rabbi uh, Wittenberg joining us from the United Kingdom, senior rabbi of Masorti Judaism. Uh, really glad you can, you can join us, Rabbi Jonathan. Please feel free to take the floor. Thank you kindly. Can you, hear, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, much better now. Yes, we so can hear it's you. Quite, it's actually quite difficult for me to hear you. 
Um, but it, it's so you can hear me all right. Yes, we can hear you, Rabbi. Thank you. So I guess there'll be several questions, and these are fairly sort of short answers. Um, in terms of climate, I'll approach this from from three points of view. One is just personal. It has always been a deep concern to me. As a human being, I feel connected with all life. I've always had a love for creation, for the plants, the trees, the animals, and I feel very closely a, a sense of spiritual kinship that God's spirit flows through us all. And um, the Hebrew Bible is, and in fact, subsequent early rabbinic texts are very much immersed in the whole world of nature and understand the interdependence between the human being and the natural world. It begins, in fact, with the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, in which there's the unfolding of creation, first light and dark, land and sea, the plants, the trees, the, the birds, the fishes, mammals, and then the human being. And one can see this as a kind of very brief account of the process of evolution, not in the least in contradiction to science. So the world of the Bible here understands us as part of a whole and very much sort of connects with my own sort of spiritual intuitions and the intuitions of so many people that we are intended as human beings to live in harmony with nature. And subsequently, it's very clear that the Hebrew Bible requires us to reverence, respect, and act as stewards and trustees of nature. The very first account of biodiversity and its importance may be the story of Noah, who in the flood, which threatens to engulf the whole of creation, takes a gene pool of two of every species with him onto the ark. So the entirety of creation is important and we're only just discovering the depths and detail of our interdependence. For example, the role of fungi underground in the health of trees, the role of bees in pollinating our orchards. So, so the Bible really holds this and it makes kind of moral and spiritual sense to me. And those two go together. But I'll also look at a more modern reading um, which challenges the anthropocentrism with which we now regard our world. And I want to read a short passage from Albert Einstein. I don't in fact know the date in his career when he wrote this, but he addresses exactly this question. A human being is part of the whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings as separate from the rest, a kind of optical illusion of our consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of understanding and compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. It's a, a lovely and rather romantic description, but I think we know, and, I, and, and you know, from visits to the Ukraine we know, that um, this is an urgent task, and war inflicts even more damage to our climate than we are inflicting in peacetime. I think of the breach of the dam above Kherson. I think of areas which are understood to be mined, the size perhaps of a country like Great Britain, and... Um, and I'm horrified by that. So uh, the, the need to rethink, the need to reconnect um, is very, very urgent, mandated by our experience, mandated by now, and mandated by the traditions of Judaism and our, our, our brother and sister faiths. I hope that's uh, an okay beginning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And thank you also for bringing uh, this dimension of the environmental destruction created by the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Our friends from Ukrainian environmental movement can speak more to that, but this is often o overlooked, that this is a war waged not only against human beings, but uh, against, against other, other life as well, with serious consequences. Uh, I'll pass it now to Sheikh Mogra, uh, with, with the same question about the inspiration that 
religious traditions can bring to the discussion on values and policies. Thank you very much. If we reflect on the global population, it's safe to say that a vast majority of humanity belong to a particular religion or a particular spirituality. And therefore I believe that if people of a religious faith can play their part in looking after our planet and those who live on it, we can make a huge contribution in sustaining a, uh, a planet that is fit for life and fit for purpose. The Quran reminds us that God has created the entire creation in balance. Everything works like clockwork. And on earth, it is the actions of humankind that create the chaos. So whatever we see around us, it is as a result of our misuse of the gifts of God that he has put at our disposal. And the responsibility given to the human being, according to the Quran, is that of God's vicegerent, God's deputy. That the human being has been placed on the planet to care for it. The planet is to be utilized to make life comfortable and livable, but not to be misused and abused. And it's our responsibility as human beings to look after it. And the teachings from all of our scriptures, uh, if I may quote from the saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he encouraged, for example, the planting of trees. And many times I've wondered that in the desert, planting trees is not an easy task. It's uh, quite a, um, a challenge to take on. But he said you, when you plant a tree, then there is not just benefit for, the, for earth, but for the individual from a spiritual perspective, that anyone who enjoys from the fruits of that tree, including animals, any traveler who sits under the shade of that tree, then the person who planted that tree will be rewarded by God. So there is this idea of a spiritual benefit by caring for the planet. And he said, if the last day uh, of the world befell on you and you had a sapling in your palms, then even then you plant it, even at that very last moment. And I really enjoyed uh, the point that you made uh, about the dignity of humanity. That God has given dignity to all of humanity. And it's very sad that the geographic north, we enjoy all the pleasures of life at the expense of the geographic south. And we are depriving that basic human dignity uh, to the people in the geographic south. I think if we as religious leaders, uh, Rabbi Jonathan, myself, and so many others, can help our followers understand this huge responsibility, particularly as people who believe in God, that we are responsible for safeguarding not just the planet, but life on earth. Uh, to remember that every human life is worth equally, wherever they may be, north or south, east or west. Uh, the Quran says to take one life, it's as if you have killed all of humanity. And Rabbi Jonathan has shared with me the Jewish scriptures regarding the same issue. And this is where our, our values really need to be focused on, to, to cherish each other, to cherish uh, life, to cherish the planet. Um, and just to finish off, um, the role of justice. Because we can have values and they could be very decorative, but if we do not implement them uh, as individuals within our families, within our circle of friends, with our associates, as politicians within our governance, and internationally as countries where different countries are treated differently, then uh, the, the point of having international law, which is applied sometimes, and sometimes it's not, and selectively, what does it show about the values that we hold, about the, the equality of 
uh, humanity when it comes to uh, all these things uh, that affect our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imam. We'll come back to the discussion on the Global South and the Global North later with the panel on EU climate policies as international policies. So we, we, we definitely be speaking more of that also in terms of actual concrete policies. Uh, but now let me pass to, to Sebastian to the, with the same question. Yeah, I'm representing here the Christian perspective, you know, as the only one. I, 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 I suppose, you know, that, you know, another person would come as from the Eastern Orthodox perspective, because it's also very important. However, uh, I would like to point to certain shift in imagination imagination uh, of uh, Western Christendom, which is represented by the Pope, by Pope Francis, especially in the last uh, few documents, including a very important so-called ecological encyclical, uh, which is uh, entitled Laudato Si. And uh, the shift of perspective is, within the Roman Catholicism, from basic uh, idiom that was that has been used you know for centuries uh, which was anthropocentric focus of uh, Christianity and of religion the Pope puts on you know something new in the sense that we have certain notion that should be used especially by Christians and it is uh, also with connection to what has been said by, by Rabbi and by you as well, uh, which is, you know, that the world was created by God, but this creation is continuous. It's still uh, how, in, in a sense, you know, it's, it's being reshaped. What is the human task is just to take care of that, to have a respect for that, for this continuous creation and being responsible just you know to protect you know the environment and not just you know to put in this very um, traditional way which that the the earth should be surrendered you know to the human beings no humans are responsible and this very focus of the pope that everything is interconnected you know all the creatures you know are inter interconnected and he uh, uh, says, you know, that it should be in the center of the Christian reflection and the Christian spirituality at the moment. You know, that imagination that you are a part of the continuous creation, but you have the most responsible role to play in this continuous creation. So this is something which is quite new within the Western Christianity, within the Western Christendom, with the Western spirituality. But, you know, as we have seen recently, uh, these issues presented by the Pope uh, influence, you know, new tendencies within the Roman Catholic Church. And we have uh, not only something which is, you know, on the margins, you know, the ecological movements within the Church. But, you know, uh, these ecological movements, you know, they organize you know, certain events, not only the public discussions, you know, the things like that, but also, you know, special prayers and special activities, you know, in order, you know, to promote ecological, uh, ecological perspective, ecological awareness uh, among the, 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 Catholic, the, the Catholics, among the Western Christians. Um, and especially it was underlined by the Pope during the pandemic's time, uh, because, you know, if everything is interconnected to a certain point, you know, we have to be responsible as part. Also, you know, for this, that, you know, we have the pandemics, you know, that spread all over you know, the world and that infected, you know, many human beings and those human beings, those people, uh, men and women were somewhat put aside, you know, and, you know, left, uh, the, 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 they, felt, they felt left, you know, by the others. They felt left 
by, uh, by the communities, especially uh, the old people, you know, the, the, uh, the people who were, uh, who were lonely, who were alone, you know, who were put aside. You know. And the Pope said, you know, it's against, you know, this basic notion of interconnectedness. And he used, you know, for the very first time something which is new in Christianity because, you know, uh, he's been talking until now about um, uh, so-called ecological sin. So if there is, you know, something, you know, a crime against interconnectedness, against creation, continuous creation, it's a, a sort of ecological sin which is, you know, very heavy heavy burden in which it's put, you know, on the consciousness of the Christians and should be constantly taken into account in, by them if it is not, you know, we are in certain spiritual crisis. Thank you so much. Uh, the questions, unfortunately, will be have to ask over lunch, which we are heading to, but now we'll have our last panel before the break. First of all, thank to, thanks so much for, for, to, the, to the panelists, uh, to Rabbi Wittenberg, to uh, Imam Mogra, and to um, Sebastian Duda. Maybe, maybe just last, last few, few remarks uh, before, before we wrap up and start with the next session. Rabbi Wittenberg, maybe you would like to start. Thank you just listening to my colleagues and i just i just want to apologize for not being able to come to warsaw we've got a an extended part of our family are two young boys who lost their father aged four and um, they're celebrating their bar mitzvah this coming they're coming of age jewishly this evening and i you know we've been i've kind of almost sort of i promised their father before he died to support their education and so i i, I can't sort of miss that I just want to apologize for not being with you in person, Mazel but listening tov. to my Mazel colleagues. Tov, Rabbi Jonathan. Mazel oh, tov. thank you. <laughs> I, two things. One is I want to just appreciate what Sheikh Ibrahim Mogra, we are very close, we are close friends and colleagues, said about um, environmental justice. It's not just a question of love of the earth, it's a question of basic justice and that of impact all aspects of our lives, how we invest money as individuals, as institutions. Um, a reduction in our own global, so in our own footprint, in order to enable other other nations to emerge and to move towards equality. Um, and I also note that on the fourth of October, Pope Francis issued a subsequent encyclical or a, a kind of addition called Laudate Deum, in which he says, "I haven't yet had a chance to read the summary, but he says our response has not been adequate." And he calls on nations to put money into what's been called, I think, a bit of an unfortunate name, the Loss and Damage Fund. That is to enable poorer nations to adapt to climate change and also to mitigate, mitigate its impacts. And this will be an urgent feature at COP28, which is beginning only in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Jonathan. Uh, Imam? I, I just want to concur with what uh, Jonathan has said. I think if each, other, each one of us takes personal responsibility, uh, not just towards climate, but in our relationships uh, with uh, the, the other creation and with fellow human beings, then we can make a huge difference. Uh, there's one fundamental flaw I find, perhaps mostly for myself, is I pay a lot of attention to my um, material well-being uh, my external appearance, the clothes I wear, etc., etc., um, and try and look beautiful from the outside, if you like. But there is something that needs more attention, and that is the heart. The, the heart needs to be worked upon. If we soften our hearts, create compassion and kindness in our hearts, and spend half the time we spend in front of a mirror trying to make ourselves look pretty and beautiful, and invest in being better human beings. I think that care will, will follow. It's, it's inevitable that when you have a caring heart, you will care for everything. 
Yeah, the final remark, I must mention something about the, the attitude of the Pope, you know, towards the war in Ukraine, because, you know, it seems to be, you know, quite ambiguous for many people, uh, especially here in Poland and in Ukraine as well, and for, for the Christians of Ukraine. Because, you know, in uh, one of his uh, encyclicals, Fratelli Tutti, he used you know, a new notion of solidarity, but he uh, went against, you know, again, very uh, important uh, notion of so-called just war, which is, you know, very in interesting and impactful notion in the history of Christian theology, that certain <coughs> wars are justified. If something like on the defensive war or something like that, if, uh, if we can uh, uh, protect ourselves, you know, from the enemies, you know, from the, from the, from the, from the violence, and the Pope challenged that issue, and he said, you know, he, he wrote that in encyclical, that we don't have to use anymore, you know, such a, such a notion of the just war. And uh, uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> and the war started in Ukraine, and uh, certain Christian rhetoric or imagination was used by the Moscow Patriarchate, you know, the Russian politicians, in order to justify the violence which is, you know, put in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, and the reaction of the Vatican was very ambiguous. Of course, you know, different issues, you know, uh, uh, which are uh, at stake here. Uh, the nation of diplomacy, ecumenical movement, you know, the Moscow, the Moscow Church, the Moscow Orthodoxy is a very important partner for the Vatican, you know, uh, it's, it's been, you know, for, 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 many, for many years in the ecumenical dialogue. So, uh, the attitude of the Pope, you know, was uh, literally uh, seen as a very reserved, you know, and sometimes too sympathetic. Uh, towards Russians. And uh, still, it seems, you know, that he really defends, you know, the notion of peace he's been promoted, uh, promoting, you know, in, uh, in the encyclical. Uh, of course, you know, he recognizes uh, the victimhood, the victimization of Ukraine, but alongside, you know, he also mentions, you know, the, uh, the victims of the on, on the Russian side, you know, which is not very acceptable for, for the Christians in Ukraine and in other parts of Europe. Thank you. So we saw into some real difficulties, as also Prime Minister Rostovsky was saying, into uh, joining values and policies in practical terms. Thank you again to all the speakers of this panel. Please, a round of applause. I think it's a very important discussion in this very difficult time. Thank you, Imam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Jonathan.